introduce you to our speaker, but first I want to introduce you that those that have not met Jared Jacobon is our new librarian. Hello, everybody. Hi. He's not new, he's used, but he's new to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here. I know that I've met a lot of you already, but if you haven't met me before, my name is Jared Jacobone. Um, I've been working over in Turrell County for about four years or so, and now I'm working over here. I've uh, been living in Chowan County for about four and a half years as well, so um, it's good to be here, good to be working with the community, and I am so excited um, that we are able to have uh, the Park Service come by today and tell us all about the Dismal Park, uh, Dismal, Dismal Swamp, Dismal Swamp, <laughs> Great Park. Sorry, it's, it's not our park walk around, but, <laughs> but uh, we wanted to welcome um, Katie Sanford, who will be talking about the Dismal Swamp and history and its environment and the whole bit. So please give her a great round of applause. And thank you so much. Katie spoke with us last year and we, we just enjoyed her so much we almost didn't let her leave. <laughs> she had boundless enthusiasm and energy and, and declares that she has her dream job. She got her education at Virginia Tech and a uh, degree in wildlife science, and she's been working um, at the Dismal Swamp State Park since 13. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Well, thank you for having me back again. I'm going to try and do this without the microphone, so can everyone hear me so far? So far. Okay. Yeah, I tend to be a little quiet. So, um, like she said, I've been at Dismal Swamp since 13, um, so I guess that's nine years now. Mm -hmm. So getting up there, um, cool things going on today as well. Right, so the Dismal Swamp is defined by two landforms on its eastern and western boundaries. So we have the Fentress Rise and the Suffolk Scar. Uh, one thing that comes up pretty often, if y'all have been to Merchant's Mill Pond, a lot of people ask if the swamp at the mill pond is part of the Dismal Swamp, and it's not because the Suffolk Scar causes the water to drain uh, separately. So the Dismal Swamp and Merchant's Mill Pond are both swamps, but they are completely different. So that landform uh, was possibly an ancient sand dune because a long, long time ago, uh, the entire swamp was actually... So one of the artifacts on my table over there is some seashells. Uh, so you will occasionally find seashells out there. Uh, so the original northern and southern boundaries of the Dismal Swamp were the James River in Virginia and the Albemarle Sound down here in North Carolina. So what we have today is still pretty big. Uh, obviously it's not quite as large as it was historically. Um, it was originally well over a million acres. Um, so it would have gone you know, further to the north and then further to the south um, in pre-colonial times. But this is what we have left. And it's pretty easy to pick it out when you look at the Google imagery because there's this huge green thing. Uh, there's a lot of housing all around it, but you can pick out the swamp pretty easily. This, are the boundaries, uh, has drainage affected the size? Quite a bit, and I'll talk about that some more in a few okay. minutes. Um, it's pretty heavily influenced by people over time, so we've, we've changed it a lot over the years. Uh, and then right here in the center is Lake Drummond, which again is something we're pretty frequently asked about at the Dismal Swamp State Park, but that is actually located in Virginia on the National Wildlife Refuge. So you can get to it from the state park, but only if you're up for about a ten and a half mile paddle from our kayak launch, which is a very long trip. <laughs> Uh, so the lake is about 3,100 acres. It's possibly a Carolina Bay, and it was named for our state's first governor, um, who's credited with discovering it um, in 1665, which officially is undocumented. I think the story goes like he was on a hunting trip and he got lost and stumbled across this huge lake in the middle of the swamp, and so they named it after him. So, um, same map, but broken down to show you what's what. Uh, the Great Dismal Swamp National Wildlife Refuge spans both states. They're a little bit larger than we are. They protect about 111,000 acres. And the state park here in the southeastern corner 
covers about 14,443 acres. So we're a lot smaller than the wildlife refuge. Uh, so both places offer recreational opportunities, but the main way I explain the difference to people is that the refuge is a little bit more conservation oriented and the state park is a little more recreation oriented. Like we both cross over and have similar projects and we do some conservation projects as well. But like the refuge, for example, will close certain areas for wildlife management or other things, whereas in the state park that doesn't happen quite as often. All right, so a little bit more about the park specifically. Uh, this is the map that's on our brochures, and I've got a big stack of those up on the table if anyone wants to take one at the end. We have over 20 miles of hiking and biking trails out there. Um, all of our trails are old logging roads, so that's why everything is really flat and really straight. Uh, the state actually purchased the land with a matching grant back in 1974. But we were originally managed as a natural area because we had all this land over there and there was literally no way to get to it. Because um, as you saw on the map, we're surrounded on like three and a half sides by the National Wildlife Refuge. And then there's a couple private parcels on the southern side of the park. And then on our eastern side, there's this big canal. So there was cool stuff and no way to get anybody in. So in 2008, our bridge and our visitor center were added that gave people a way to access it. And at that time, we were redesignated as a state park. Was the property in private hands before the state bought it? The state actually purchased it from the Nature Conservancy, who had acquired it from timber companies who had owned it prior to that. When was the wildlife refuge established? I am not 100% sure. I think they're a little bit older than we are. Thank you. I would have to look it up to tell you for sure. Well, so we are the second largest park in North Carolina state park system, which is, I think we're officially at 42 now. I thought of us for a long time as one of the newer state parks, which we were when I first started there. But in the nine years that I've been with state parks, they've added a few more. And we're not really that new anymore. <laughs> Um, but we are still the second largest by land acreage. Uh, South Mountains out near Morganton is a little bit bigger than we are. They have about 19,000 acres. Um, but we're pretty, pretty good size. Um, and then we've also got a little boardwalk out behind our visitor center. That's a really nice, easy walk. Um, you don't have to worry about ticks and the bugs are usually not quite as bad out there. And every now and then you get to see some really cool things out there. I was on the boardwalk a couple weeks ago and saw a sow and two cubs standing like 20 feet away from me. It's pretty really cool. <laughs> Alright, so if you haven't been before, that's our visitor center. It's on the western side of the canal, so you have to walk across our bridge here. Uh, the bridge is kind of like the main hub of everything at the park. Uh, we always have to have somebody on the bridge when we are open for visitors to come in because the Dismal Swamp Canal is an active waterway. And so there's boat traffic to keep in mind and so we always have to keep an eye out for boats. And then when we leave at night we open the bridge so anyone on the park side of the bridge who doesn't come out in a timely manner, if we don't know you're over there, you will be stuck. <laughs> so whoever is watching the bridge will ask you, you know, are you going to the visitor center, just the boardwalk, are you going to go down the trails? And if you tell us you're going to go down the trails, we ask that everyone signs in and we get a description of your vehicle and where it's parked, and that way, hopefully, we will not lose anybody out there. And it has happened. So the bridge cost about a million dollars to install. Um, I was a little intimidated by that when I first started because one of the first things you have to learn, everybody who works there, we all have to be able to operate the bridge. And so I was like, it costs how much? I'm not sure if I want to touch this. <laughs> but it's really not that bad once you get used to how it works. Um, and that's it. it gives everybody a way to get in, so it's pretty important. Okay, so a little bit more about history just in general as far as the swamp. This funny looking guy is credited with putting the Dismal Swamp on the map. He was part of a survey team in 1728 and their job was to establish where the state boundary was between North Carolina and Virginia. So they 
started on one side and cut through all the way across to establish where the state line was. He was not really a big fan of the swamp. I think he called it something like a, a bog of mire and nastiness or something to that effect. Um, he must have gone in the summer when the bugs were really bad and just not had the best time. Um, he did, however, propose the idea of a canal and the Virginia Assembly approved that in 1787, and then it took North Carolina a few more years until 1790 to get that approved. Uh, there is a little bit of resistance, uh, mainly from the Edenton area, because at that time this was the main trade center, and so they were concerned about losing that if this canal was put in that would link um, to Norfolk, Virginia. But one of the major proponents of the canal was a gentleman named Hugh Williamson, who was from Edenton as well. Right, so George Washington is another major historical figure associated with the swamp. Um, he visited in the 1760s, and there is a ditch running east to west that carries his name today. That's on the National Wildlife Refuge, but there is a Washington ditch out there. <laughs> founded the Dismal Swamp Company in 1763, and their main purpose was to drain the land for farming, because uh, the colonists looked at the swamp and saw no value in it in its natural form, so they were like, well, if we could make it more useful, we get all the water out of it, maybe we can farm it, so uh, that was when all the ditching and crosses started, and today there's about 200 miles of ditches crisscrossing through the swamp as far as that, uh, that goal goes. It didn't quite work, so they decided the next best use for it was to harvest the timber. Uh, so if you visit the swamp today, um, people will frequently come into the visitor center and they'll ask me, they'll say, well, where is the swamp? Because they expect to see like, a lot of water and cypress trees, and it's just not there anymore. And the efforts of these logging companies and the settlers in the 1700s and 1800s is why. Uh, the cypress and cedar trees that historically dominated the swamp were all harvested because they had a really durable wood, so they were excellent for like, roofing materials, anything you want to build out of wood. And then that, along with the ditches that didn't entirely drain it, they just made it a lot more dry. But that allowed things like oaks and maples and hardwoods to come in behind those trees. So what you see today looks like this beautiful, untouched forest, but in reality, pretty much every acre out there has been logged in these swamps. And it's a lot different than it did back then. Mm -hmm. So Washington became disillusioned with these efforts in 1793 and sold shares of his company to Henry Lee in 1795. <coughs> Lee was not able to pay for his shares that he purchased, so they ended up reverting back to George Washington's estate in 1809. So, and then another thing that comes up quite a bit is what dismal actually means. Um, so the settlers, like in Washington's time, called swamps dismals. So it's a little bit redundant to call it the dismal swamp because dismal already means swamp. So they call that one the great dismal because of its size. And then somewhere along the way, we added the swamp to the end. So we're kind of calling it the swamp swamp. But that's what it is. So I guess the, the William Birds and whatnot had some influence on that. So everyone's like, this dismal it must be like a really gloomy place. And like, no, that's just what they called swamps. So, and then that picture is just an image of George Washington um, serving the swamp. He was a fan though. He called it a glorious paradise. So I'm more inclined to go along with his description than the words. I think it's beautiful. Out there. <laughs> okay, so then, as far as the canal itself, uh, it took quite a while after Burr's original suggestion. Um, so as I mentioned, he served was on the survey team in 1728. So many years after that, they finally got together and started digging this canal. So um, today, it's an alternate route part of the Intracoastal Waterway. So we, it's managed by the Army Corps of Engineers. It's dredged on a five-year schedule, generally. And we have 
the last average I checked was about 1,400 pleasure boats a year come through. So that's pretty much all we have today. Commercial traffic doesn't use it anymore. Um, but we get a lot of sailboats, a lot of power boats. Um, mostly they come through in the spring and fall. So if you want to see the boats, so like March, April, and then late October, early November. Apparently November 1st is the magic day as far as insurance purposes for when they can go south. So we have a lot of snowbirds. So in the fall, they're all going south down the canal. They go to Florida, the Bahamas, and wherever else to stay warm for the winter. And then in the spring, they're all going north and they're going to go back home. So not a bad idea. I don't like cold in winter. So, uh, that's just the boat going through there, and then that's a jar of swamp water, which I brought the real thing sitting over there on the table. Uh, our water is a very unique color. I think your water around here probably looks pretty similar, too. It's got that nice brown color. I love to ask all the kids on the school field trips, I'm like, so do you want to drink this? And they're all like, ew, no, it's got animal stuff in it and dirt. And I'm like, well, actually, swamp water is really clean got that brown color because of the tannins from the tree leaves that have soaked into it and so that's what makes it brown and that also makes the pH really low like if you put a test strip in it it comes in at about a four and a half so it's really acidic um, the settlers actually used it for fresh drinking water because that low pH meant that it stayed fresh for a long time so they put it in barrels put it on the ships and take it with them and that was what they drank so the main reason I would not recommend drinking canal water today is because of our proximity to Highway 17. So there's going to be some pollutants and runoff from that in there. Um, but like Lake Drummond in the middle of the swamp, that water is probably not bad. I haven't tried it yet because I don't get out there too much, but from what I understand, it's pretty clean out there. Alright, so the year construction began on the canal was 1793 so again it took them quite a long time after the suggestion to actually get everything together and get started on it and it was not completed until 1805 so that makes a 12-year build process mm -hmm. which when you consider that its total length is 22 miles long and the whole thing was dug by hand you can kind of see why it took so long So that's a, just an image of what it might have looked like as the canal was constructed. Uh, most of the workers who dug it were enslaved people who were hired out by the people who held them. And so they were standing you know, waist deep in the muck and the mosquitoes and the bugs in the summer with shovels. Of course we didn't have modern machinery back then. so. Every day they would progress about 10 feet. So construction started at the north end and the south end, and then they met in the middle. And there's an angle, uh, which I'm told was intentional. Um, so when you stand in the middle of our bridge, you can look up and see about five miles, give or take, and then you can kind of tell, if you look with the binoculars, you can see the tree line where it turns there. So at this time, the canal was privately owned. And it remained privately owned until 1929, which is when the US government bought it for half a million dollars. So uh, over the years when it was first constructed, it had, I think at one point, seven or maybe nine locks along it. Um, today we have just two locks, one at each end, so boats enter at South Mills, which is five miles south of the state park, and then the other in and out is at Deep Creek in Chesapeake, so where that little teeny narrow bridge is, um, that's where the boats that pass through our bridge are coming in and out of the canal up there, and that's 17 miles north of us. Um, so at one point in time when the canal was privately owned, there were tolls along that route, and so uh, one of the things that the government did when they purchased it was to remove the tolls. Because um, a, a little before the government purchased the Dismal Swamp Canal, the Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal was built. And that one goes through like Great Bridge and Currituck. And that one, when it opened, did not have tolls. And so it really was a, a serious competitor and kind of reduced the traffic on the Dismal Swamp Canal. 
um, because of that. This is a lighter boat, which you can see at the state park. We have this along our canal road trail. It's about three quarters of a mile down from the visitor center. And this so is what word were you using? A what boat? Lighter, L I G H T E R. Okay. Uh, I think, stuff. Yeah, I think they called it a lighter Water. because they would take um, cargo off a larger boat to lighten okay. the load, and so they put it on these smaller boats. So this is a small flat bottom boat, and I know you can't really get a feel for the size of it just based on the picture, but it's probably about, I don't know, four or five feet wide and maybe 15 feet long. Wow. So as you can see, it's pretty small. And when the canal was initially completed, that was the size boat that fit on it. It was described as being little more than a muddy ditch when it was initially completed. It would have been about 18 inches deep. Um, a little bit wider than this boat here, and then there was a towpath running alongside it because, of course, this boat doesn't have a motor on it, um, so it has these loops at each end, and so you put a long pole through it, and then someone had to push it to get where it needed to go. So, yeah, we've come a long way since then. <laughs> um, I, can, I can just imagine shipping things to Norfolk that way. Um, because that's where most of the cargo on the canal is headed. Uh, we also have Cross Canal that comes from the Gates County area across the, the swamp at about 10 and a half miles long that connects to the Dismal Swamp Canal. And so that was how Gates County got all of their goods over to the Dismal Swamp Canal. And then from there, things could go north or south. So the lighter boats were used to move pretty much everything around. One of the top products that came out of the swamp was cedar shingles. And the structure that is around this boat, um, I didn't get one with the roof in the picture, but if you come out and see it in person, the roof of the structure is made out of cedar shingles. Um, so those were actually produced like in their, into their final form in the swamp and then loaded up onto the boats ready to be installed. And they would send them out. Is that boat a survivor or is that a, um, a reproduction? It's a reproduction. Mm -hmm. And actually, one more interesting point. Um, the chain link fencing, we've actually since replaced that with angle iron, but that's because of the bears. They love to mess with anything and everything out there. Treated lumber is one of their favorites. And so in an effort to prevent them from chewing through the posts and destroying our structure, we had to wrap the posts to keep them from tearing up. <laughs> They're very mischievous. They get into everything. All right, so um, that's a picture of one of our trails today. So like I mentioned earlier, it's a lot drier than what most people expect to see. And so I think I mentioned already that all of our trails are old logging roads. So as the ditches were dug, they would pile up the spoils and then the roads would be made on top of those. So there's a lot of soil compaction out there so the water can't really flow freely anymore. Um, so you'll see a lot of subsidence. Like if you look off the trail, you'll see trees and the soil is like down here and the tree roots are all sticking out up at the top and it looks like there should be more soil up there and there should be but it's kind of like a sponge the way the peat soil is so when you take all the water out of it it kind of collapses down and then creates that problem so the water table out there today is a lot lower as well and then those are like some of the maples and the oaks and as you can see not too many cypress or cedar out there mm -hmm. there's a handful of cedar you can see if you're up for about a six mile one way hike. Um, pretty much no cypress out in the main part of the swamp. There's a few you can see off of our boardwalk, um, but most of those are gone today. So, further consequences of human tinkering over the years. Uh, when the peat soil is drier, it's more prone to catching on fire. Uh, this is a photo of our 2011 wildfire, which was fortunately the last big fire that we've had. Hopefully it stays that way. Uh, that one was started by lightning, because when the lightning strikes the peat, you know, it's got everything it needs to start a fire, and then the peat tends to smolder, and it can also burn underground, which makes peat fires really challenging to fight. 
So this fire in 2011 ignited on August 3rd. I remember because I had just moved to North Carolina and just bought my house and we were coming back from Elizabeth City and we are like, that looks like smoke. And then on the news that night, it was, oh, the swamp is on fire. And I thought, that's awful close to my new house. <laughs> but fortunately, it all stayed in the swamp. And then at the end of August, a hurricane came through and dumped about eight inches of rain. And that did not put the fire out, but it did give the firefighting crews the upper hand to be able to get it under control. So I think we had about 6,600 acres altogether burned in that fire. The majority of that was on the National Wildlife Refuge, but kind of the northwestern corner of the park, uh, if you're looking at the map, out at the corner of Forest Line and Quarter Peak, um, some of that burned as well on our side. <coughs> Another interesting aspect of swamp life was maroon colonists. So we're still learning a bit more about them as we go forward. So many enslaved people, as I mentioned, were the primary workforce for digging the canal. And so they spent so much time working in the swamp that they got pretty familiar with it. And so some of them were able to use that knowledge to escape from their bondage. So at one point in time, we thought that the swamp was primarily important as being part of the <coughs> railroad, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, but we think now that it was probably even more important to these maroon colonists who actually established permanent settlements out there in the swamp. Um, some of them might have just stayed there briefly and moved on. Um, but we think that some of them actually set up like homes and built cabins and farmed. And uh, when I show you some of the photos at the end of our plant and wildlife, uh, there's plenty of things to survive on out there. So it wouldn't have been an easy place to live by any means, because back then it was still a lot wetter. Uh, so the researcher who's done most of the studying on the moon colonists is named Dr. Dan Sayers. He presented at the park a few years ago. It was a really fascinating talk. And so he looked at old like images of the land elevation in the swamp, and he figured out that there were these music islands, which were little areas of high ground. And that's where he started looking for the maroon colonists. So he said that most of the artifacts they find are like pinky fingernail size. So we're talking really, really tiny fragments of things. Um, but I remember in his presentation, he showed us a photo of where they had done some excavating. And he said, this was a post, and then this was a wall here, and this is where the door was, where the cabin was. And that was like, really fascinating. What was that word you used to describe that? Sound like music or something? Music Islands. Yes. M-E-S-I-C. <clears throat> And then just a few images of what the maroon colonists might have looked like, maybe a temporary shelter there. Um, unfortunately, if you're interested in that, there's not really anything to come out and see in the swamp. Like the location of where his work is, is not, like he doesn't share that with, you can't walk out and go look at it and see anything. It's also really hard to get to most of these places. Uh, some of the interviews I've read with him, they talk about him wading in through like thigh deep water and muck, and there's a lot of briars out there. So these are some really remote places. <coughs> um, but that's where they lived because it was that or be held in bondage. So a lot of them chose to live out there because at least they could be with their families and be free. So the belief mm -hmm. is that the swamp was home to the largest marine colony in the United States. Mm. And the only number I was able to find was that that could have been possibly 50,000. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but um, that's just digging around online looking for various sources that would you know, tell a little bit more about how many there were. And that was what I found. Okay. Right, so underground railroad, of course, it wasn't underground and it wasn't a railroad. There were railroads running through the swamp as part of the logging operation, but that was completely different. All right, so the underground railroad was 
a network of people and places to help enslaved people who were traveling to areas where they could be free. Um, so the Dismal Swamp is part of the National uh, Underground Railroad, or National Park Service's Network to Freedom, and we were added in 2003. So, I think the swamp is the only site that spans two states to be on that list. So, and the purpose of that is just to have a national network of sites with a verifiable connection to the Underground Railroad to try to promote understanding and awareness of it. Um, so, again, that was part of what the swamp was used for, but we're kind of focusing more on the maroons now because we think that um, that was probably the more important use of the swamp for those people, was the ones who lived out there permanently. Then, of course, Civil War um, in 1861. So North Carolina, of course, as a southern state, had seceded. And so we're probably mostly familiar with like Antietam and Gettysburg and Appomattox and a lot of the major battles. But North Carolina was a critical player as well. And the town of South Mills, where the state park is located, actually had a fairly major Civil War battle. The Battle of South Mills was on April 19, 1962, and 3,000 Union forces under General Reno were sent down to take control or destroy the South Mills locks, because of course the Dismal Swamp Canal was a good way to get equipment, goods, troops, boats, anything from one place down to another, so having control of the canal was a pretty big deal for both sides. <laughs> So 900 Confederate troops under Colonel Wright managed to stop the Union forces and kept them from reaching the locks. So both sides ended up claiming victory in this battle. Uh, the South, the Confederates claimed victory because the Union forces were not able to take or destroy the locks, and the Union side claimed victory because the Confederates did retreat. Uh, so what I read was that there was a guide who gave bad directions to one group of the Union soldiers and they ended up doing a 10 mile detour and arrived a little bit late to the battle. <laughs> so, <laughs> who knows what would have happened if they had got there when they were supposed to. So, um, this bursted ditch I think was where the Confederates were entrenched and so it was a pretty intense battle for that little bit of time. And so this is South Mills, and that's where the canal starts, right there. Is that all on property? Just on private property now? I think most of it probably it's like is. Yeah. yeah, I know there's a few like markers on the side of the room, but I know the Welcome Center next door to us has a brochure with like a Civil War driving trail. If you're interested in that, I'll give you a little bit more info. And so those are the, the two gentlemen who were leading each side. Do you know if General, that's the General Reno that was with uh, Custer? I believe so. It was, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so other fun things about the Swamp's past, like I said, it had a colorful history. Um, moonshining was pretty popular for a while, um, from Prohibition until about the 1960s. And the Swamp was a great place to hide liquor stills because there were a lot of myths and tales about swamp monsters, and basically a lot of people just didn't want to go in there. Uh, if you've ever tried to walk through any place off the trails in the park today, it's a tall order. There's a lot of vines and thorns, and it's very hard going, so was a good place to hide stills. So we have our full-size replica here. Uh, so it doesn't work and you can't make it work. There's <laughs> that quite a bit. The pipes on the top are just PVC and they're supposed to be yeah. copper. Um, but it looks pretty neat and there are the remains of some real stills down our Supplejack trail. Uh, so like just to the left of the still there, like kind of over in here, there's a path that goes into the woods. And if you walk in there, there's one that's like right next to the trail. And it's all blown in because the federal agents who were tasked with finding these stills would take sledgehammers or dynamite to them and destroy them when they found them. So this will 
be one of our demonstration staffed exhibits in a few weeks at our fall festival that I'll tell you a little bit more about at the end as well. Uh, so he'll actually get a fire going on the boiler and make it look authentic. <laughs> There was a Mr. Sawyer out of uh, Elizabeth City that was the number one bootlegger. <coughs> yes, I've, I've read quite a bit about him. Yeah. I think he was the one who the judge asked him if he was going to make any more moonshine, and he said no, but he wasn't going to make any less. <laughs> <laughs> but the coil here on the end actually did come from a real still that was dismantled and we were able to get that. So we have tons of wildlife. Um, some of it is more enjoyable than others. We have a lot of ticks unfortunately so Fall and winter and early spring are probably the best time of year to visit if you don't like the ticks, because any time the temperature is above 55, they will be out. Um, so the boardwalk is also usually a safe bet to avoid the ticks as well, because there's no grass and brush there for them to get out there. But uh, we have ticks like there are not ticks anywhere else. I don't know why the swamp is so bad, but it is. If I go off the trail, like anywhere, I can pretty much rest assured I will get at least one or two on me. And unfortunately, I'm something of a magnet for the seed ticks, which are the little larval ones that are kind of hard to see, and they love to get on my feet and go through my socks and chew up my feet. So I keep duct tape in my truck for that reason, because duct tape is the best way to get them off. The larger ones, like this Lone Star, you can grab them and pull them off with the tweezers. Um, and that's probably our most common tick species. Not a major carrier of Lyme disease, but they do carry some other diseases as well. So what species yeah. is this? Dog ticks? Or? This one is a lone star tick with the white dot on its back. We do have a few dog ticks and some deer ticks as well. Uh, we had a researcher from the CDC came out a few years back and he had a permit to collect ticks. And we said, please take, take them. them. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, where's a good place to go get them? And we said, anywhere. Literally just shake a bush and they'll be out there. But the one thing that he told us was that we had way more uh, Lone Star ticks than he needed and he was trying to find more like the dog leg or the black tick and the, the um, deer ticks and the dog ticks and he was having a harder time coming up with them. Um, then we also have flies of all sizes and colors. There are green ones, yellow ones, black ones, big black ones. They all bite, and they're all kind of aggravating, but they have fortunately seemed to have kind of backed off for the summer. They were real bad for a while. Um, in the middle of summer, like late June, July, the boardwalk is so bad with the flies, if you, you can't stop, because if you do, they will just come into your face and drive you crazy. So like, just keep moving. <laughs> if you're moving, they're not horrible. Then we have a lot of different kinds of snakes, which depending on whether you like snakes or not is a good thing or not such a good thing. Uh, I personally really like the snakes because I think they just kind of get a bad reputation and they have their place in the ecosystem. Um, this is one of our more common species, the eastern king snake. And that one is immune to the venom of our toxic species, which would be the copperhead, the cottonmouth, which I don't see a whole lot of, but they are out there. And then we also have timber rattlesnakes. So if you don't like those guys, the king snake is your friend because he'll eat them for lunch. <laughs> and this down here is the cottonmouth. So like I said, we do have the three venomous snakes out there. Um, copperheads are supposed to be the most common. I've seen a handful of copperheads, but I've seen more rattlesnakes than anything else. And we have a lot of timber, or you'll also hear them called canebrake rattlesnakes. And so they're not real common. They were actually listed as an endangered species for a while. I believe they've since been delisted in North Carolina, but they're still not real common. Is a cottonmouth the same thing as a water moccasin or not? Yeah. Usually those are intended to be the same. Um, a lot 
lot of people will call any water snake a water moccasin, but we do have probably four or five different water snakes that are not venomous. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so if I say water moccasin or cotton mouth, I mean a history of that particular species. So there's pretty much any snake that a lot of people see in the water. It's like, oh my gosh, it must be a cotton mouth. But more often you'll see brown water snakes or northern water snakes. So we have quite a few of those. And of course, we're pretty well known for our black bear population. There are quite a lot of them out there. Ooh. Nobody has estimated the population since I think like 2005 or so. And at that time, the estimate was about 300 bears. Um, they need a lot of space and a lot of food, and so there just aren't really too many places left around here for bears to have a good home. But um, they've got the space and the food and the swamp, so there are quite a few of them down there. Um, they're not as easy to see as if you go down to, say, Alligator River. Um, they'll usually see you and take off running. It's probably one of the top two questions I'm asked is what should I do if I see a bear? To which my answer is try to take a picture before it runs away because they're normally <laughs> gone before you can even click the button. It took me nine years to get a good picture of a bear because I have all these pictures of the trail with nothing in it because there was a bear standing there until I pushed the button to take the picture and then the bear was gone. <laughs> they're very fast. Um, they're really shy. Um, they prefer to investigate things when we're not so we have to be careful what we leave out uh, when we're not there because trash bags, lunch boxes, tractors, other equipment, anything like that, they will investigate while we're gone. Uh, I had to fish a big stack of cones out of the ditch one time because we left those out every night and the bears got curious and put in the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then like I mentioned, they also like to chew on our trail signs. So you'll often find on our kiosks where everything's all flawed up and then they'll scratch their back on it so you'll find bear hair stuff there. <laughs> um, then we've got here a bobcat. Bobcats are pretty secretive. I've seen maybe half a dozen in the time that I've been there. Of course, they're generally nocturnal, but you will see them sometimes during the day. Um, then of course we have foxes, coyotes, raccoons, possums, skunks, most of the other critters you'd expect to see. And then I've brought a beaver pelt and a river otter pelt are over there on the table. Um, otters are one of my absolute favorite critters because they're wildly entertaining. Um, so sometimes you'll see them real early in the morning in the canal swimming right near the bridge and then most of the time they're going to be out more towards the center of the park. So they'll hang out in the ditches out there where the wildfire was, it kind of turned into an impoundment because where all the soil burned away, it's all full of water now, so the beaver and the otter like to be there quite a bit. And if you like bird watching, we have about 170 different species of birds documented. Uh, I just picked one of my favorites, which is the barred owl. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see them very often, but you'll hear them calling sometimes, um, even during the day. They make the funniest call. If you've never heard one, it sounds like he says, who cooks for you? <laughs> Not a traditional owl call. Most of us think of the great horned owl, it just says, who, who? Uh, and we do have those as well. And then the other kind of owl that you might hear in the swamp is the eastern screech owl, uh, which is itty bitty teeny tiny. We have a mount in our visitor center lobby, and everyone walks in and says, oh, look at the baby owl. It's a full grown adult, it's just little. And they make a sound that sounds kind of like a horse whinnying from off in the distance. And so I think the noises like that is probably where a lot of those spooky stories and myths got started with the swamp because these animals make some noises that if you've never heard it before, and especially if it's dark, like, what in the world was that? And so I think that's where all these stories about the monsters and things got started because someone heard something and wasn't sure how to explain it. Um, bobcats make some pretty interesting noises as well. They can make some screaming sounds. And, uh, we have a few other birds that make some interesting noises as well. Um, night herons are another one that make a noise that does not sound like a bird when you first hear it. Oh, 
and then the only other thing I know that I didn't put pictures on here, but back in um, pre-colonial times, you would also see wolves, uh, bison, and mountain lions in the swamp as well. All of which are gone now, as well as alligators. I get asked that question fairly often too. Everyone wants to know if there are alligators in the swamp. They say not that we have seen. Historically, there would have been alligators in the dismal swamp, so it wouldn't be unheard of for them to come back. But to the best of our knowledge, the closest alligators are the ones at Merchant Small Pond in Gates County. And then we have all kinds of plants as well. Um, some of them are hazardous, and some of them provide food. Uh, this obviously would be a hazardous one. That's a tree called Devil's Walking Stick. And it's got thorns like that all around, up and down the entire length of the trunk, and all the branches out to the leaves. If you make a mistake and grab one, it hurts. Um, they do have a fruit that grows on the tops of them around the leaves that the bears like to eat, so the bears will pull them down on the trails to get to the fruit at the top. I don't think that one is good for people to eat. Um, this one is edible for people. That's a pawpaw. You ever heard the Burl Live song way down yonder in the pawpaw patch? Uh, that's what he's singing about. They are right, pretty much right about now. Um, so you'll see them, especially along the Supplejack Trail. The trees are really common in the understory, and they have this really big, you can kind of see the leaves a little bit, this really big oval-shaped kind of tropical-looking leaf, and they are just everywhere out there. They taste like? A little bit like if you put a banana and a mango and mix them together. I'm not super fond of them, probably because I don't really like bananas too much, but apparently you can make like ice cream with them and you can eat them plain and they've got great big brown seeds in them. A whole lot of them. I serve it. Uh, we, we've got a pawpaw patch. We live in mm -hmm. Canberra and it makes wonderful pawpaw bread. It really are muffins. You can make jam. I've never made pawpaw jam. But pawpaw bread, pawpaw muffins, you, it's a good taste. Those sound good. So like, I like bananas if it's in banana bread, but I don't like them plain. And you eat raw. And the only way I've ever tried pawpaw is plain. So I'm like, I'll just leave those for the critters. The bears will eat them and the box turtles. Because they, once they get right, they'll fall off the trees and they end up on the ground. And the supplejack trail just smells almost sickeningly sweet in the fall because they all come down in such big numbers. Uh, the other cool thing about pawpaw trees is that there's a compound in the bark that might possibly be used to cure cancer someday. Um, I think the very unscientific explanation is that something in the compound prohibits the cancer cells from reproducing. So, neat little factoid about the tree. I don't know exactly where the research is on that. I haven't checked recently, but uh, when I was reading about pawpaws a few years ago, I came across that and was like, wow, that's really awesome. This unassuming little understory tree that's all over the swamp might, might have some something big to contribute someday. Um, other edible things, there's a handful of blueberries out there. Uh, lots of blackberries. The blackberries all have thorns on them, so they're pretty easy to find too. But the blackberries are tasty. This one is my favorite. These are ripe right now as well. Those are muscadines. <coughs> There's grapevines all over the place out there. They have a really thick skin and huge seeds inside them, but they taste amazing. So they're ripe right now, so that's, that's the color they get when they're ready to go. And then, let's see, got wax myrtle is another common tree out there. Um, this vine is the one that our Supplejack footpath is named for. That's what Supplejack. Oops, sorry. So um, Supplejack uh, was real common along the trail when the Supplejack trail was put in, so that's what it gets its name from. The vines get huge. Oh, God. This is probably one of the largest ones I've ever found. They get real thick and they'll grow really tall and they'll just kind of wrap themselves up the tree. Um, and then once once you've picked it and it's dried out, it gets brown like this. But when it's alive, it's a real pretty shade of green. 
and it's nice and flexible so you can make like a basket out of it or if you get a thick piece it makes decent walking sticks as well. Oh. And it's another one that's not my favorite. It's very common out there. We have a lot of poison ivy in this lawn. So leaves of three, leave me be. I am very good at identifying it whether it has leaves on it or not because when I was before I turned 24, I could walk through poison ivy and I was fine. And they say the older you get, the more sensitive you get. And I got this weird rash one day. I was like, what is this? Finally figured out it was poison ivy. And ever since then, I can just barely touch it and I will get a horrible reaction to it. So I always pay attention to the poison ivy. It seems like half the trees that fall down in the swamp that have to be cleared off the trail are just covered in it. <laughs> And then added a few more of my favorite flowers. We have so many neat things out there. This is another one that's in fruiting right now, so we get asked about that quite a bit. That plant is called beautyberry, American beautyberry, so it's a native shrub. I love the berries, I think they're really pretty. I'm not totally sure if they're edible for people or not. I've done some digging trying to find a definitive answer and I found some like .edu reputable websites that say yes you can eat them and some that say no you shouldn't. So I've decided to err on the side of eating those for the wildlife. Uh, from what I can tell, it looks like if you are sensitive to them they might give you a mildly upset stomach. But they're pretty to look at and if you want to encourage wildlife around your yard, great native landscaping shrub. Um, this one is a passion flower. So they're pretty much done blooming. That's usually an earlier summer bloom, but that's one of my favorite flowers. I really love that one. And that's another vine as well. Um, and then that one. Katie, the passion flower has a lime looking fruit. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? And I have researched that and it's edible. It's not very good, but it is edible. <laughs> <laughs> it they will receive My mom used to make jelly out of wild passion uh -huh. fruit. Okay. Yeah. They're yeah, exquisite flowers. I think they call them maypops. Maypops. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And then that one is a smock mallow, um, and a hibiscus type of flower. I have a lot of things that I'll tell you are my favorites. That's another of my favorites, <laughs> flowers. Um, they're really beautiful, and that one is growing right in our little rain garden where we've got three cypress trees, so when they're in bloom, you can see those right outside the visitor center. And then this last one down here is a flower, but that's actually from a tree. So that's from a tulip or yellow poplar, which is another one that's pretty common out there. Uh, so in the spring, it'll get those flowers that look a little bit like a tulip, hence the common name. And um, so those are pretty common along the boardwalk. Um, they have a really unique leaf that's like truncated, kind of flat across the top. If you can see the leaves. I like to look at tree bark, so I feel like the tulip trees are fairly easy to ID by their barks. They have kind of smooth bark and they have a really straight growth form. Alright, so some of the things that we have going on today. Well, we have an annual paddle event that we hold the first Saturday in May called Paddle for the Border. We had to miss a few years because of the pandemic, but we did have it this past May. Uh, so I think they take 300 and 350 registrations. We end up with like 300-ish, give or take, canoes and kayaks. And everybody brings their boats to the state park. And we unload them all in the parking lot. And then everyone drives their cars up to the north end at Ballahat Road, which is the takeout point. And then the shuttle carries them back to the park. Everybody launches, paddles seven and a half miles up past the state line, and then take out at Ballahack. And there's lunch and music up there. And it's a really fun day. Uh, so that's what it looks like when we're launching all those. It takes probably close to an hour just to get everybody into the water. So we've got, well, since this picture was taken, we added a little two kayak launch that's like kind of a taco shaped thing and you put your boat in it and then you can pull from there. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, So we can launch roughly four boats at a time now. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the event that's coming up and I think I have another slide with that one towards the end. 
that's yeah the next slide I'll focus on that one some more but that's our dismal day our fall festival that's coming up in October and uh, that was the year we got the Coast Guard to bring their helicopter as a demonstration and they actually landed it in the field right across from our parking lot which was pretty awesome then we do both on-site and outreach education events. So I do a lot of field days in the fall, and we're finally starting to get the school groups come back to the park again, because again, kind of a two-year break with the pandemic. So I miss that, because I love nothing more than seeing 80 or 100 first graders running around in the park. <laughs> and then this is our wagon. Um, that's another thing we've got going on pretty much every Sunday. With one exception, we're missing one Sunday in October um, so far, but we do wagon rides every Sunday at 11 and 2. So if you want to come out and get down Canal Road a little bit, see the liquor still and the lighter boat without having to hike all that way, you can come out and do a wagon ride. Yeah, so there's a had to put a slide in for Dismal Day because, again, took a two-year break with the pandemic and we're super excited to be doing it again this year. Uh, so in the morning, we have a 5K fun run uh, for anyone who wants to participate. That one's free to sign up for. And then we just have a whole bunch of different vendors and exhibitors. Uh, the Edenton Fish Hatchery is planning to come with an alligator to exhibit. Who else is coming? I'm trying to think who's committed for sure. We're still in the planning stages right now, so we're kind of finalizing who all is coming. Uh, this group, I'm not sure if they're bringing the wolves back this year, but Newell Farms comes from Halifax County, and they are planning to come again this year. Um, the first couple of years we did Dismal Day, they brought their gray wolves every year, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. They were just beautiful animals. And um, then, like I said, the liquor still will be a demonstration exhibit <laughs> that day. Um, we do a bounce house for the kids, and the wagon runs throughout the day. And there's sidewalk chalk and arts and crafts for the kids, and some food vendors. Uh, Williams Farm usually brings their ice cream trailer. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of everything out there. And that's October 22nd. And there's little half sheets up there with the date on it if you want to grab one. So some of the projects that we've got going on today. Uh, this is the red cockaded woodpecker here. Uh, so the refuge does most of the work with the RCWs, but I was able to help them out one year. I got to go out and help install them. They bring them in from other places. It's an endangered woodpecker that we're trying to reestablish in the swamp. And so they have them driven in from other places that they're relocating them from. And then you have to go out in the middle of the night and put them in a tree cavity and shut them in and then you go back at sunrise and open the door to turn them loose. Um, so I got to be out in the swamp until two o'clock in the morning putting woodpeckers in trees and then was able to pull the string and turn the male loose in the morning. So that was pretty awesome. Um, Eastern box turtle. We participate in the box turtle connection which is a statewide study about the turtles. I so actually found one today and was super excited because it was only my fourth one this year. Oh, wow. um, so we weigh them and measure them and we have a little filing system so we can mark the outside of their shell with notches which doesn't hurt the turtle but allows us to identify the turtle again in the future. So we can get kind of a population estimate of the turtles in the swamp and pretty much we just don't really know a whole lot about box turtles. Like we think they might live a hundred years or so but the data is not out there. So. We are adding to that. So today was turtle ANV, and he was a very pretty male with very colorful skin. So I put him in the system and got his data uploaded and took all his pictures and all of that. So tomorrow I'll have to carry him back out and let him go where I found him. That was the one good thing about the rain last night, because rain always brings the turtles out. <laughs> so then this is a water control structure. So I mentioned that um, over the years the swamp had been ditched in an effort to drain it. We've pretty much done a 180 on our swamp management since colonial times. They cut the trees down and tried to get the water to come out. And now we are planting trees like those little white cedars in the corner there. And we're building these water control structures to try and make water stay in the swamp. Because um, we've learned 
now since then that it actually has quite a bit of value in its natural form as far as like wildlife habitat, a place for people to enjoy um, catching sediments and pollutants and just generally doing a lot of good things for us. Um, but unfortunately, filling in the ditches wouldn't solve the problem because I mentioned the soil compaction over the years prevents the water from flowing freely, so we're kind of trying to strategically place these structures to hold water back in certain sections of the swamp. So this is the largest of the structures. There are four total on the state park side, and one of them is actually part of the South Martha Washington Trail, so you can walk across it. And uh, this one is another thing that I don't like so much because this is Phragmites, which is a non-native invasive, so um, we're trying to keep that under control before it gets too established and too spread. So uh, a few of our other invasives, we have a lot of Chinese privet, we have some Japanese honeysuckle, some princess tree, things like that. So when we find those things, you know, we'll go in and try to cut them down and you know, spray and keep them from coming back and keep those under control to try and promote our native species. Right, and then I think pretty much most of the rest of my slides are from our construction project because when I was here last year I was working out in Merchant's Mill Pond because the swamp was closed for construction and it took a little bit longer than we anticipated but we did finally reopen in May of this year. And so it's kind of hard to see exactly what all got done when you come to the park. Um, but we did a lot of drainage work because uh, our, our buildings here, the edge of the canal was eroding and so things were starting to kind of lean forward so we had to shore everything up and try to divert the water to keep it from puddling around the buildings and other places we didn't want it. So new concrete poured, uh, all new asphalt there. A lot of that was like regraded again to try to influence the drainage to keep it from ponding because it would all puddle up right in front of that door there, which was not good in the winter because then it would freeze and then we'd have ice and so hopefully all of those things will be fixed now. Uh, and then we actually had the entire bridge taken out to be repainted and cleaned up a little bit because since it was installed it had never been taken out of the water. <laughs> so they pulled the whole thing out and floated it away up the canal to Chesapeake to get repainted and have all that work done on it. So, no bridge. How did people get in and out of it? That's why we were closed, because that's our only access point. So when we took the bridge out, there was literally no way for any, unless you wanted to swim. So, so that's why we were closed all that time when this was getting done. And then uh, this is a more recent picture. So we have this gravel pad for our kayak trailer to park on now. And that's the kayak launch that I mentioned earlier. And our sprinkler system up because that all got sodded just recently. So it's all, all looking good now. And then another thing that we did kind of towards the end of our closure was some major work on our boardwalk because um, the swamp tends to rock wood in kind of short order. And so there were big sections of our boardwalk that had rotted pretty sig significantly. Sorry. So we spent probably a week with some teams that came in from out of town to help us out. And as you can see, we put in a lot of new lumber and got the boardwalk back in good, safe working order again. So if you want to stay up to date with things that are going on, um, you can follow us on Facebook, the Friends of Dismal Swamp State Park, and then our newly redesigned State Park's website. Um, all of our programs are listed on both of those as well. That's all I've got, so if you have any questions for me, I think I took pretty much all the time and then some, but... <laughs> yes. We're good. Where did the name maroons come from? I believe it was a Spanish word, and I think it meant like isolated or adrift or something like that. Do you have people showing up at the park that uh, might be descendants of maroons? I think a few have, or at least some that are interested in that history, like Moses Grandy, anyone who's related to him, uh, he was a pretty prominent 
a well-known person in Camden County, um, the road in Chesapeake was actually named for him because he was a waterman on the canal. So he's probably the best known. Do you have many black people visiting? Um, I mean, I, I don't, we don't really keep track of that information. Well, I noticed there are none here tonight, which is kind of surprising to me. But Yeah, we, we get a lot of people from all over, especially with the boat traffic. You have people from other countries. Um, pretty much everyone seems to come through, which is how we want it. We want everybody to come out and enjoy the song. You showed um, red cockaded woodpeckers. Mm -hmm. My understanding is they need stands of longleaf pine to nest on. Do you have longleaf pine in the swamp? We don't have much longleaf pine, but the refuge has actually created artificial cavities because you know they use the live trees that have the heart rot disease to make their holes. So the refuge has created artificial cavities and a lot of the pine trees out there for them to use. Is that effective? <laughs> There's not like a huge population, um, but they have had some nests with chicks hatching. Okay. So I think there's maybe seven or so out there the last I checked. Yeah. Do you uh, use prescribed berms for any kind of vegetation management? The refuge does. We have not done any on the state park side yet. Um, just I think because of the, the hazards of doing even a prescribed burn in the peak because there's a, a lot of possibility for that to go wrong. So, we'll see. I was just wondering, were, um, any Native Americans, were they ever um, inhabit the swamp? We think they probably lived around the edges and like hunted in the swamp versus actually living there. Uh, I think a few artifacts have been found over the years as far as evidence of them being there. Uh, and your effort to try to reestablish some of the hydraulic patterns or the, the water control structures is the, one of the goals to reestablish uh, more wetland plants, perhaps uh, cypress and other trees that would find it suitable. Hopefully, if everything works and you know, the water table comes back up, that would be the long-term expectation that those plants would start to become dominant again. The only thing we've like actively replanted in the years that I've been there is the Atlantic white cedar seedlings, which they can grow in some drier areas. If you come out to the park and go on the boardwalk, the little V, uh, the boardwalk goes off and makes kind of a figure eight so you can go left or right, and the little V at the entrance, we have some that we planted in 13. And it's pretty dry there, but they seem to be fairly happy. They've gotten probably 20, 30 feet tall in just a few years, so it's very satisfying to watch them grow. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, thank you. It was wonderful. And uh, now, now I want to go visit the Dismal Swamp because I've been driving past it a lot. Of visits, visit, uh, visit up into Virginia, but we hear that a lot. We're right there, but come check it out sometime. Well, thank you, thank you. Good time of year for it. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for attending today's uh, uh, Armchair Traveler event. Katie, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.